Hey, welcome back to In Light of the Gospel. My name is Dan Blatz. Today I get to speak to one of my oldest friends yet again. His name is Jake Lowen. Some of you might have known him as Schmertz in your teenage years. We'll get into that a little bit. He no longer goes by that name. Um, and uh, I think you'll really be pleasantly encouraged by this story, how God can take a young, carefree, careless, uh, pot-smoking man and turn him into a faithful husband, father, and now training to be a pastor. I think you'll be really blessed. So God bless. Thanks for tuning in. We got the one and the only Jake Lowen online with us here today. Some of you might even call him Schmertz. I never did. <laughs> but uh, Jake and I go way, way back. We were neighbors from the time we were, I don't know, five. No, I was probably nine or 10 years old when you guys moved in there. No, actually, a little younger, seven or eight. And yeah. so Jake and I knew each other from way back, played in the sandbox together all the time, had apple wars in our backyard. When we were upset with each other, throwing apples at each other, and uh, just a general good time together a lot, right? I mean, through the years, you, we kind of drifted here and there, but you'd come over randomly at family gatherings and stuff. So we always had a little glimpse into your life. But the whole Schmertz thing, I didn't, I was not participant in that. I don't know where that came from or why they were calling you that. Yeah, that that's the Schmertz thing. There was a couple of reasons for it. And one of them was that I used to work at Scott Lewis Auto um, after school. And at one time I was going to be an apprentice there. And I was always working on cars and I always get so dirty and oily and all the uh, grease from. And then one day somebody just said, hey, Schmertz. And so that's kind of, kind of stuck, eh? how it started. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, I heard people calling you that, and I didn't, I didn't, never did. To me, you were Jacob, Jacob Lowen. Yeah, I was, I was Jacob for many years. Um, yeah, I remember when we moved to Mount Salem, I think it was 1988, 89, right around there. We moved in 89. And yeah, so we would have been right around later 89, and that time, I think it was. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I was Jacob from young on, and and finally, uh, I guess in high school, I was Jake. Yeah. So <laughs> you were uh, the youngest of how many? Six, six siblings? Six siblings. So, well, six of us together. I have four brothers and one sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you were the young brat, the youngest brat, eh? I was the youngest brat that uh, that had a different way of thinking and had a different way of doing stuff just because my entire I guess um growing up phase was in Canada and where my uh parents and everybody else grew up a little bit in Paraguay at the time right. you were born in Paraguay I was born in Paraguay and then we left Paraguay when I was about four years old mm -hmm. so what was it like growing up as the youngest I, I think it was, uh, uh, it was good. And I think it was difficult at times. Um, I think you're, you're typically always blamed for something goes wrong or, or something happens. It's, it's gotta be Jacob's fault, Yeah, you know, and he's the mischievous, uh, mischievous one. Um, he's the one that's always got that smirk on his face. And I was a pretty, uh, happy go lucky type of kid. Um, you know, growing up, I just, I just wanted to have fun. I wanted to ride my bike and, and skate and play hockey and, and uh, just whatever, do stuff like that. And, and so in that regard, um, I think the youngest is always heavy, heavily influenced perhaps by other people yeah. that are older than you. Yeah. You, you often had to fight for your way too, right? Your older brothers were already married when you were quite young and uh, there was a lot of, uh, blaming like you said but fighting for for what you could get right that's right yeah there was always it was like a a survival of the fittest if i may use that <laughs> analogy just trying to find your place um in the family and i think that that uh that's something that you didn't realize until later on it's like you always had to somehow find uh, your place in the family and fight for it right so then uh, obviously during like high school, er that stage where you got to be about 15, 16 years old, you went to East Elgin? 
Yes. Yep. I went to East Elgin and uh, I had mixed feelings about it because I had just graduated uh, Summers Corners grade eight and uh, I had some good friends at Summers Corners and then I went to high school and I was, uh, I guess, you know, a clean kid at the time and I wanted to play football and so I started football and I played uh, football in grade nine and 10. And as you know, um, there's a lot of peer pressure once you're in that setting mm -hmm. and you want, you want to be, I guess you want to fit in somehow. And as an individual, naturally, I think it's, it's overwhelming how, how much you want to fit in, especially right. in high school. Well, even I just think about, I'm analyzing from the outside, but you were the youngest and often kind of maybe looked down on as the little brat, the little troublemaker, and you're trying to, to do stuff to, to fit in, to be accepted in a way. And now here you are with a group of your peers who just accept you for, your, for who you are. They think you're funny. They think you're a fun guy to be around. And then immediately you fit in with these people, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, and, and I think that that's, that's an interesting way of putting it because... I think that everything changes, obviously, when you become a Christian, people accept you, um, they accept you for who you are, and, uh, and they just love on you. And I think, as a kid, you, you miss that, that aspect of, of love and what it is to, to be loved as a child. And then as you grow up, you get into high school. And then you start wanting to really fit in and then you end up with the wrong crowd because that crowd accepts you just for who you are, even though it's the wrong crowd. And then next thing you know, you're, you're doing things that, uh, that are not good to your body and honoring to, uh, um, to Christ. So like, what, what do you mean then? Cause obviously there was, everybody just wanted to have fun. There was a lot of probably partying after hours and stuff, drinking and stuff like that already or not really? Yeah. So, so what happened was uh, in, in school um, in grade nine, I was, I was clean and, uh, and it was, it was pretty decent. I had some really good teachers. I mean, I remember my keyboarding teacher, Mr. Schleihoff, Okay. He was an interesting fellow, but he was so good to me. Hmm. He kind of took me uh, under his wing. And, and so did um, a retired police officer that's, that's unfortunately passed away already. And his name was um, Officer Lemur. Hmm. And he was from Elmer and he kind of took me under his wing. And he and was at the school? Yes, he was volunteering. He was an Elmer police officer. And he was volunteering at the time. And uh, he just encouraged me to uh, pursue your passions. And at that time, I actually wanted to be a police officer. Okay. And I remember him bringing me a pair of real cool cargo pants, uh, you know, that he wore as an officer. And uh, he, he was just a fine gentleman that helped me. And the unfortunate thing, once I got to grade 10, uh, the wheels fell off the wagon. Okay. <clears throat> what do you mean by that? Well, I, I ended up um, having a, a real close friend of mine introduce marijuana to me in my life. And basically one day he came by, had some marijuana, and I said, uh, what is that? And, and he says, marijuana, do you want to get high? And, and I said, okay, I guess I'll try it. And basically I tried it once and I was hooked immediately. And after that, I just uh, became, I guess, enamored with it and started hanging out with the wrong, really the wrong crowd, which was a crowd that was really accepting me for who I was and not mm -hmm. judging me constantly at that time. Right. And, and so I just felt like naturally I fit in and these people actually, you know, and to, an, to a degree, they care about me. And so I just... Uh, I went that, down that road and partying and, and drinking. And even though I didn't, I didn't drink much at the time, but I was always, you know, uh, I was always smoking a joint. I see. So th at this point in time, you and I weren't really getting together that much. We weren't kids playing out in the backyard anymore, right? 
but I remember, mm-hmm. I remember you getting uh, really loud a lot of times, right? You would blare your music and sing along with some of this uh, stuff that you were doing, right? And, and then I heard that you were smoking marijuana, things like that. And I, I had no concept of that even. I had never been around it. But uh, yeah, you got, you got pretty involved. And I think people enjoyed being with you because you were always, always the life of the party, always laughing and joking and making everyone else laugh too, right? Yeah. And I think, I think naturally there was just something that, that, um, uh, you know, draw people to me. Um, I can't really explain it because when I was a kid, I was a pretty happy kid. I, I love playing sports. I just wanted to do those things and just, just play with the neighborhood kids. And, mm-hmm. and now somehow between, you know, I think, I think 11 years old and 15, somehow it just, those feelings were suppressed and I didn't really feel, I guess, the love in my own family. And so I went somewhere else and that Avenue, unfortunately was drugs. And like you said, almost anytime you, you start something unique, there is a kind of a community there, right? Like there's a community of guys that are doing things that are not good, but you're, you're together in it, right? Yeah. That's, that's the crazy thing is that, is that when you get into a community like that, or even whether you get into a community of belonging to a, a biker gang or a, you know, a a car show, you belong to a certain car show or whatever. For me, it was lifting weights and stuff. like Yeah. Yep. There's a sense of community or going to the gym. There's that community where you're not judged. They just accept you and, and you just move on together. Yeah. So would you say that marijuana was actually addicting or you just did it because you enjoyed it? I think, I think I did it primarily because I enjoyed it because it was an escape. But you, you could es- spend a day or two without it. It wasn't that big a deal. Yeah, there was there was a couple of times that I just I would go a whole week without it. Um, But after after a few years, it just I don't know, it it just somehow you just you want to, I think, do it every day just because I think it brought you further into depression and Mm. where this was the only thing that kind of lifted you out of it because it, it altered your your um, your thoughts i see i know a lot of people right now are endorsing marijuana and saying that it's actually really not that bad it's better better for you than alcohol perhaps and it's less damaging to your body less taxing and it really just mellows you out and stuff but then people on the other side are saying that it's a major gateway drug right where it's you you're using it to escape your reality and then feel a certain way and then you just need more and more of that to feel normal right yeah, I think I think to a degree, um, I would definitely not endorse it. Um, even though, even though myself, I've had some health issues, especially with TMJ. Um, my my jaw is <clears throat> is much better now. But uh, a few years ago, I did I did try some doctor prescribed CBD just to right, not try to, to get, get high not to get high, just to get the pain away. Cause I was going through an immense amount of stress and, uh, neurologically it really affected, um, my whole, um, you know, my whole brain and, and just the pain. And, and I think that there is cases for that, but if, but especially if you're somebody that thinks, well, it's legal, it must be good. Um, I can just go buy a joint at, you know, tweed or whatever store of your choice. I think that there's, there's a fundamental issue with that because um, we ought to be sober minded, uh, not just in substance, but in, in train of thought in our thought pattern. And I do believe that it does alter our thought pattern because it may, may not happen in the first six months, but it will happen after a a year, perhaps. Hmm you think it actually altered the way that you viewed life altogether? Absolutely. I I do believe that. In what way did you become more careless or more carefree or what was it like? I think I became more careless mixed in with carefree because, uh, because marijuana does numb you. It does numb you over time. And 
the things that matter, um, you just tend to be carefree about it, that they're not that important, you know? And so uh, I think that there is a, a real concern in that regard. I see. So did it lead you into other issues, into other sins, perhaps? I mean, you became kind of um, volatile, right, in some ways, where you were like really, really happy and super excited, and then all of a sudden you drop off and be really angry at somebody or... Yeah, I think it does, it does uh, affect your moods in every way. Um, I think in one regard, um, if you're high and then you come down, you have a bit of a, I guess, a, a process of getting there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it can alter your mood swings too. Um, but I think, I think many times that when I tried to clean myself up, uh, I think that there was so much uh, conversation and, and I think, I think gossip from others, because there was many times that I tried to clean myself up. And but then when I heard those things, it just kind of brought me right back in it, because the mm. idea was that I could never, you know, get free from this. I see, you know, and so, so rather than I, I, their, their criticism, rather than giving you any help kind of drove you to say, well, I don't care what you think I'm going to do it even more. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the mentality and, and which is really hard because sometimes society is, is pretty hard on you. Um, and sometimes the unfortunate thing is that even as, as believers, and I'm guilty of this myself, we don't always do the right thing in terms of helping someone that is struggling in, in terms of substances mm. where you know, if I look back, um, if I would have just heeded the warnings of people, especially these good people that helped me and carried me like this officer Lemur, um, I would have, you know, I wouldn't have had to go through this mess, but, and, and I find it, it's very difficult and it's sometimes it's very heartbreaking, but I can't go back now. Yeah, that's right. So this went on kind of from age of 15, 16, right through your teenage years. Yeah, right, right around age of 16. And I, yeah, and I was, when I got saved um, at 20, 21, um, that's when it, uh, it kind of, that's when it stopped. And I remember it just stopped one day, cold turkey. Um, I was, I don't know, many people probably don't know my testimony, but, uh, but there was, um, there was an evening I was coming home from a friend's house and and this was like at three in the morning and I was in a thunderstorm and I was coming to uh to Springfield Road and I was on 45 Calton line there and I came to the corner and I was going to turn right to go to Mount Salem and and all of a sudden my truck just stalled it was my dad's little Ford Ranger that he he drove for many years and yep. I remember the vehicle stalling and it's just pouring rain and thundering. And I knew I already had uh, family praying for me, especially my brother-in-law and my sister. And they, by the way, they bought me my first Bible. And, Pete and, Anna. and so, yeah. So I remember, I remember them praying for me. And I remember the kindness that they showed me even while I was in my addiction. And, and so that night I'm sitting there with my truck not starting. And I'm just, I'm just crying out to God. And I said, God, I know, I know my life of drugs has to stop. And I said, Lord, I said, help me get home and I will do whatever you want. Uh, please save me. And I just cried out to God. And cause I was at a dead, dead end road and I didn't know what else to do. Um, you know, the life that I envisioned was not, was not pleasing. Um, I was sick of it. And basically I'm sitting there sobbing and within a couple of minutes, I tried to start the truck again and the truck started and I went home and my life has never been the same since that day. You knew that something happened right there, that God there I, answered your prayer in some way. Yes, I knew something happens. You know, I knew that the Holy Spirit supernaturally worked in me. And I knew from that day on that I could no longer look at sin the same way as I did before. Right. 
So while you were in your life of, of partying and smoking and all that kind of stuff, was there a lot of guilt and shame or did you kind of numb most of that? There was a lot of guilt and shame. Um, I, I do believe that. Um, there was some things that you as, you know, a sinner would go along with. Um, but then there was other things that you just really thought that uh, that was not very pleasant, um, wasn't right. Excuse me, I just have to sneeze. Yeah, so I think that there was certain things that that were extremely difficult to go along with. Um, certain times, you know, I, I saw how women were treated and how guys would treat women. And even in my state that I was in, I didn't appreciate it or I didn't like it that that's how, you know, uh, females were treated. Um, you know, how, just how do you just, mean? Like, I, I think to a sense that a lot of them, uh, we have to admit they were just treated as sex objects. Okay. And so even those things didn't, you know, they didn't really jive with me where I, I had a hard time with that. Um, you know, uh, I remember one time I was in school and I had, I had smoked for a few years cigarettes and there were some kids. Um, I was in, I was in St. Thomas at the time. And there were some kids that came and said, hey, can you buy us a pack of cigarettes? And these were like 14, 15 year olds. And, and I said, no, I, I won't do that, unfortunately. And so the guy beside me that I was hanging out with at the time took the money and then just walked off with it. And that really, you know, really affected me. And I'm like, this isn't right. Like, even though, you know, I was in that state of living that lifestyle, but I knew that that was wrong, you know, mm -hmm. what this guy just did. Almost like you were you were enjoying enjoying the lifestyle, but you weren't doing it intentionally to hurt people or to be somehow corrupt and evil. You weren't stealing and robbing people and taking advantage. No, I <laughs> no, I wasn't doing that. Um, you know, I never considered myself a thief, um, even though you know the Johnny Cash says GM wouldn't miss one little piece. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I never considered myself a thief in that regard, but I, I think I did it as an escape because I think the deep rooted issue was much bigger than I thought. And mm -hmm. it all has to come down to um, your family life and growing up. And the whole aspect of it is love, you know, as a kid, you know, like, are you loved? Did you grow up in a family where you felt the love and the presence and and that unfortunately that really got to me and i think i did this now as a cover and as an escape just because i want to feel that i belong somewhere i see yeah i remember like i said during those teenage years when you were into that stuff you and i didn't get together a whole lot but if i remember several times having a family gathering my whole family was there george and aaron and pete and everybody comes home and we could almost count on it that at one point you would show up you know whether we're having a barbecue or whatever and you know here comes jake yeah. and, and everybody's like hey <laughs> come on in and you would join us for a meal and we always enjoyed your your shenanigans and your fun talk right yeah, I, you know, and that's the cool thing about it is that um, I was always accepted by your family. Um, it didn't matter who, like to this very day, I can stop and talk to all of them. Yeah. And we can just carry right on as being, uh, you know, friends for a long time. And there's no issue. And we can talk about anything. And, and that's one thing I really uh, appreciate it. Yeah, you know, I understand I understand every family has its issues too, but some have it more than others. And, and I think to a degree, um, you know, there are examples of families that, uh, that kind of encompass that, you know, that wonderful bonding uh, relationship with each other. Well, I'm often amazed. We have our share of issues. We had all kinds of relationship issues and uh, squabbles in the home and stuff. And somehow through the years, we've all, been able to sort things out or just not hold grudges and we all get along quite well and we all see very similarly uh, the world and the way things are right so it's been good 
That's but anyway, good. your your brother in law, he was preaching the gospel to you as well, praying for you, gave you a Bible. Yes, yeah. So I had uh, I had him to probably thank him personally. Probably led me to Christ the most out of anybody. Um, Some of your friends the, were getting saved at the same time too. Big Jim Weeb and them guys. Yes, yes. Jim Jim got saved during that time, and I got saved just shortly after. Um, but I remember, I remember uh, Pete had to do a lot in my life at that time in terms of uh, uh, praying with me and just just showing me unconditional love and helping me, uh, you know, to get um, to where I needed to be. And and even though I had Jim and and Joe, we get saved and all that. That that was that was good. But I think the primary individual would have been Pete. Wow. Well. Now, I know a lot of times the cross and the simplicity of the gospel often isn't really seen that clearly when we first get saved because we don't understand exactly what happened. Like you said, you were just like, God, if you get me out of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something different. And sure enough, you changed the way that you lived. You stopped the smoking and the drinking and whatever else. But when do you, do you remember when you first really saw the, the, the great work of the cross and how complete it was? Yeah, I, uh, I think that it took me about five years to really see it. And I, and I remember sitting in Elmer in our duplex that we we're living on at Holland Ave at the time. You were married then already? Uh, yeah, we were married. And I remember sitting there one day and, uh, and I remember reading the book of Colossians. And after reading the book of Colossians, uh, that all things were created for him and by him. And I just remember, you know, just reading it and it just really settled in that, that Christ really paid it all and that it was, it was him, his finished work on the cross. And it hit me pretty hard. And I remember calling my, a friend of mine that was in BC at the time. And I just said that, look, he really did it all. And, and that was the time that it just kind of sank in. Wow. But by then you had already been living a Christian life for a while. You got married and got baptized and all that good stuff. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I got saved and then I, I had baby steps and where I need to be. And then, and then about five years after it just really hit me. Yeah. And I, I look at those kinds of stories sometimes and I wonder like, did you get religious and walk away from your sin and then get saved five years later? Or I think probably more likely is that God is very gracious with the way that he accepts people, right? Like, even if you didn't fully understand, you didn't have a real mm -hmm. good grasp of his cross, you probably in some way saw him being merciful and gracious and kind through the cross some way, right? And then mm -hmm. later on, it's like, oh, wow, that's way more than I realized. That's, it's a lot more than that he did, right? Yeah, I, I, think, that, I think that positionally, I was saved, but, but now I was being changed incrementally to a degree, like in terms of my knowledge of the cross. I, I believe that I was freed that very night from the drug addiction that I was on, because I remember the next day, it was completely different. Um, mm. my, my desires for it were gone. My thought pattern, everything had changed in that regard. But now me understanding the fullness of the gospel I mean, I still marvel to this day of the fullness of the gospel, but in terms of knowing what the Bible says and teaches, I just knew that I needed to be saved and Jesus was the one that could do it. Amen. Yeah. So I guess if we go back to that night, you, you got some kind of breakthrough with God. You started, uh, stopped living in your certain sins anyway, right? Stop doing the marijuana and whatnot. Yes. And that's started correct. reading the Bible that Pete gave you. Yes. Did you immediately yep, I, start attending Bradley Street Church or were you already there sometimes or? I, um, at the time, I remember, I remember I came a few times with to Lighthouse and I went there um, a couple of times. Because that's where Pete Nana uh, Yeah, that's where Pete Nana were. And then I just, I ended up just going for whatever reason. I guess I know now that my wife was there. Um, I ended up attending uh, Bradley Street, and I started Bradley Street in 2000 and 
uh, about 2003-ish or so. Oh, wow. Yeah. There was a lot going on there at that time, right? Schuler and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, he just came there and there was a building project that had started shortly after. And basically, I just, I don't know, I, before for me even knowing that I would, you know, I would meet Laurie there. I, um, I ended up uh, just attending there. And the interesting thing is, is that um, in 2002, I think it was before I was saved um, or kind of in that same area, um, I was, I was working at North Star and I was working at Hargrave at the time doing the extrusion. Mm -hmm. And I did it for one year and then I got laid off, uh, but they wanted, they were going to lay me off, but they accepted me uh, to go to the window plant. And so as I'm at the window plant and I was there only for, for two months perhaps, and then I was fully laid off. And uh, so basically one day this lady comes by and asked me what my name is and who I was. And her name was Mrs. Peters. Oh, yeah. And I had, I had, yeah, Maria. And I had no idea that this was going to be my future mother-in-law. And so, and and this is the crazy thing and how God works. Okay. I, I met, you know, my future mother-in-law there. I had no idea. And then later on, you know, I go to Bradley street and I'm talking to Mrs. Peters there. And then her two daughters came by and introduced uh, themselves to me and I said hi to Lori and I said hi to her sister and uh, next thing you know I'm calling her and asking her on a date and so this is how you know this is how God works and and I I can only thank God for everything that I have like like it's amazing it's it really is a miracle Um, you know when someone comes to the cross and find salvation that is the greatest miracle that ever happens that you can change or that god can change a hardened heart a sinner and turn them into a redeemed individual amen from from young pot smoke and schmertz to now uh, preaching and teaching and potentially going to be a pastor there in manitoba and stuff like this is not this is not your doing just like oh i'm going to be a different person yeah. now right you know That's you're still right. the same character to some degree we still just have a blast hanging out. You're a hoot, you know, you're fun to be with and you have your highs and lows Thanks. like you did then, but there's a redeemed quality to it now, right? Where it's, it's not just about pleasure and getting high and, you know, it's, it's amazing. To yeah. Work. Yeah. You know what? You're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, they're like, you guys have been instrumental in my life and hanging out and you've done wonderful things in our lives. And we're very grateful for that. Um, I think that the whole thing about this journey of faith and the gospel is that just because we're saved, it doesn't mean that we don't have moments of, of uh, sorrow or moments of stress. Like I still find myself, if I let myself um, have it, there is moments of, of light depression and i i don't want to admit it but there is and mm-hmm. i think a lot of it has to do with possibly a shame and the way i grew up and and stuff like that and that i can't change but over well overall i know that christ is bigger than all of this and that i just put my hope and my emphasis on him so i don't go into that uh into that depression yeah See, that's the thing for me when I look at what the cross has done, like it left me as the same person. Like I I still have all the same potential for sin and for temptation as I ever did. I I would still naturally tend towards being a typical Blatz, a typical damn Mm Blatz. That's who I would be. But knowing that the old man is crucified and I was taken out of the old man, placed in Christ, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Now I have a choice. I can walk according to how I feel, think, taste and Mm -hmm. see or I can walk according to what God has said about me. God says, you are no longer in the body. You are free from sin and dead to it, and you're alive unto God. And now I can reckon myself to be dead indeed to sin, or I can continue walking after the flesh, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. there's now an option. It doesn't mean I'm yes. always going to walk after the spirit. Sometimes I do walk after the flesh and it, I can go right back to default Dan. But uh, yes, there's an option now. That's right. Um that's a very good analogy. I, 
I remember growing up and I was constantly teased by family members that I was adopted. And that really hurt at the time. Really? As a kid, as a kid, I was eight years old and it really hurt me. And I had a very difficult time with that. But now as an adult, I look at it in terms of a light of the gospel where I am truly adopted, Amen. you know, I, you know, as sons and daughters that now I'm a child of God and that I have been adopted into the body of Christ and that those things no longer offend me. Okay. Um, there's other things that hurt sometimes things that, you know, lack of communication. Um, those things kind of hurt me because people, tend to do the minimal and sometimes I get a little bit impatient with that um you know and, and so I have to work on myself in that regard um but yeah there, there's many things that I can say that I'm not happy with that that God is chiseling away at me in my life mm -hmm. and I and I see that everywhere I go but then there's other areas in my life and I'm just amazed at how far God has taken me Amen. And that I can't, I can't take any, any credit for. Yeah. Well, that's uh, when you, when you mentioned that uh, five years after you got saved, you were sitting there reading the book of Colossians and you're, and it finally kind of clicked and you realized how much Christ had actually done and continue to learn how much he's actually done. I think mm -hmm. that's about the time frame when you and I started hanging out again, we were yeah. uh, building yeah, our house right. in Vienna and you and Lori stopped in. We didn't know you guys at all. You were uh, considering homeschooling and Lori was still working. She was thinking about maybe staying home with the kids and all that stuff. And at the same time, I think we were probably listening to some of the same audio teaching and messages and coming to that same understanding of the gospel at the same time. Right. So that's mm -hmm. when we started getting back together, probably in uh, 07, 08. Yeah. Somewhere that's in that right. Point, maybe 09. That's right. Yeah. I remember that first time we came your house um we were my wife and i we were avid you know public educators we you know we had our first child and we were gonna just send her to uh to public school and that's what we were gonna do we had never even thought of home educating um we didn't know from a practical standpoint how it would unfold how it works and everything and i think you guys had uh, a big impact in just us seeing what you guys were doing, not in terms of, you know, uh, academics in itself, but just in terms of character of children. And that's something that my wife really appreciated and liked. Um, and so we've just, we've kind of just uh, home educated uh, our kids their entire life now. And our daughter is 12. And, you know, I mean, we're not certain yet what we're gonna do for high school whether she'll go to a Christian school or not. But at some point, um, you know, if things don't get any crazier, but in society, which, you know, I'm not holding my breath, but yep. at some point there is an incorporation of the real world. And we're just trying to figure that out as we go along and what is best. And we'll, we'll look at that later. But, but as of right now, um, I think, I think it's overwhelming. And what people don't realize is that, that character truly matters in a child's heart. You know, um, you can have the all the education in the world, but if you don't have a good character, no boss is going to hire you. Absolutely. And we live in a day and age where uh, academics and education of the mind can happen at any stage, right? You can learn more now in a few hours than when we were kids than you could have learned in a week, right? You can pick up uh, a phone and watch a YouTube video on something or you know, take an online course or whatever it might be. So we have tried to focus on that idea that um, one of our friends actually in Texas, he said that they, they purposely set a day, maybe kind of like 12, 13 years old, where until that point, they focused on academics, or no, but sorry, they focused on character and Bible knowledge and uh, learning right from wrong, righteousness. And then at the age of 12 or 13, they kind of opened the doors and said, okay, now what do you want to learn academically? How, which direction do you want to take this, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting take. Not that we have necessarily followed that exactly, but when they were young, we focused much more on, on conditioning and insulating their souls so that they would know to choose the right thing and to refuse the evil things, right? Yeah, yeah. 
No, and that's that's a great way of doing it. Um, yeah, I, I'm amazed at you know what your kids can all do and and the artistic skills and and it, it's incredible. Um, we were at uh, a little while ago. We were at um, our our Russian German friends here in uh, just outside the city, and uh, and they have five kids, and their twelve year old son is driving a Massey one thirty five. He's bailing hay. Wow. And, and he's, he's riding a bobcat. They're building a house. They're doing all these things. And then they have, then they have a nine-year-old daughter and she's reading uh, Nancy Drew books. Okay. And it just comes to show that our, our society and the way that we're supposed to think isn't always right because there's so many kids, so many parents doing a fantastic job with educating their kids in terms of, of character, um, uh, understanding the Christian worldview, and then uh, fantastic at art, mathematics, English, reading, whatever, and they're doing fantastic things. And then now to incorporate yet with you know the internet, and there's so many programs, as you said, that you can get educated in a heartbeat if you put your mind to it. Nice. Um your uh your personal character and your wife's don't always jive fully obviously like every marriage right that's right but how and in what way has the gospel shaped and formed your marriage obviously we've seen it grow considerably we've been hanging out with you guys for the last 10 years 12 years something like that and uh, we've seen a lot of growth and a lot of good things Mm -hmm. there can you talk about that for a minute yeah, I think I think the gospel in itself um, has a tremend- has done a tremendous work in our lives just because we see that without Christ, what we are as human beings, and that we are not, you know, we're not good people apart from Christ. Okay. Mm-hmm. We may do good things, we may do nice things, but apart from the gospel, you know, we are not good people. And so I think that's really shaped us in terms of understanding each other's roles. Um, You know, my wife, my wife herself, I mean, I I think the biggest thing that we jot, what we, you know, sometimes butt heads is because we're both the youngest in the family. Okay. Okay? And, And so there is, there is something about a psychological pecking order in the family. Um, you know, if you're a middle child, there is some truths to that. Yeah. Um, we happen to be both, you know, the youngest in uh, siblings uh, in our families. And so sometimes, you know, um, we see things differently and we don't want to come to common ground. But apart from that, the gospel has really changed us and molded us absolutely into, become, into becoming who we are. And and sometimes, yeah, we have a disagreement, but we can come together collectively knowing that we, we both have a different role in our marriage and that we have to come together in terms of a Christ-likeness and to be able to work together as, as a awesome. you know, husband and wife. Yeah, for sure. No, that's good. I mean, we've clearly seen that from you guys, for sure. Um, One thing I find interesting in the last few years, your life has kind of taken a turn ministry wise, probably in the last five or six years or so, you've been preaching pretty regularly, mostly in low German. And then here and there, some, some main messages for your church in Elmer. And Mm -hmm. how did that kind of come about? What, what led you to be one of the speakers and teachers? Um, Yeah, about, about five years ago, um, pastor friends, just came up to me and said, are you, you know, we're thinking of, of doing a, a low German service. There's a, there's definitely a need for it. And he just asked me if I'd be willing to, uh, to be one of the uh, low German uh, preachers. And I said, well, I'll, I'll pray about it. I said, my, my uh, German is not that great. And, and he says, well, here, here's the Bible. And so he gave me a low German Bible and I went home and I started reading it. Okay. And, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll attempt this. And, and I remember my first sermon. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was, it was horrendous. And, you know, and I feel sorry to this day for the people that had to listen to it. 
but you know, and I think people got and, a kick out of it. Like they're, they appreciated <laughs> the message and your struggle to try to get the right words out. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, to a degree, it was, it was the kind elderly people that came up to me after and just encouraged me. And that kind of kept me going. And, and as time went on, I, I believe I got a little bit better. And, and then I started filling in as a, as a lay pastor here and there, uh, just preaching a message once in a while. And, uh, and then, you know, a year and a bit ago, or not a year ago, but in, yeah, a year and a bit ago, we were asked to possibly come into the ministry. There was some things in the fire um, that didn't work out. And then this past uh, January, February, we were asked to see if we would like to come to Winnipeg and to live right in the city wow. and, and to work uh, in the ministry. And, and I said, well, we're going to have to pray about it because um, we, we just had put our life on hold with the other, um, you know, other calling into ministry that didn't pan out in the end. And, and, you know, God knows best what is, what he wants for us and what he wants for his children in general. But we felt that this was the right thing to do. And so, so we just, uh, prayed about it for, for several weeks and we gave our answer and, Next thing you know, August 16th, we left home in uh, Sparta. Wow. I, I mean, in the last few years, you did a bit of hopping around, right? You were at Remtech. You had a decent job there and kind of decided to try something totally different. Went into uh, car sales and that kind of took off for a bit. You did pretty well. You guys moved from St. Thomas to Sparta, built that beautiful house in that nice little corner country lot that I'm sure if anybody knows Jake's place, you, you're like, that's, that's the kind of place you want to stay at. And you were there for a number of years, finished the basement, get everything all set up to go. And then just when it looks like you got a place to settle down at, all of a sudden there's this calling to move off to the coldest city in Canada. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, that one, that was interesting. And, and I feel for my wife. But yeah, I, you know, just to go back a little bit, I had worked at Remtech from 2004. I did my apprenticeship there. I got my journeyman ticket, so I'm a licensed machinist, and then I worked there till 2016 in September, and I had left to pursue sales, and so I worked for Chrysler in, uh, in Tilsenburg at Eichenberg, and I had worked there until March 2020 when COVID hit, and then I lost my job for four and a half months. Uh, thankfully, um, um, a friend of mine had a concrete business. I was able to work for him just to survive because the, you know, I couldn't work in sales anymore at that time. And then uh, I was called back eventually in July. And, and basically there was a lot of uh, steps that I had to take if I wanted to come back in sales and that there was layoffs going on. And and in the meantime, I had talked to Remtech. And so I went back to Remtech, which was the wisest decision I, I made. Um, you know, I, I had left just, there just initially. Just to stop you there for a second. You made another very wise, bold decision right there and then that maybe you're kind of glossing over like it was nothing. But you were kind of given an ultimatum. You could choose to stay in sales. Yes. And I, yes. I really appreciated and respected you for your, your calculated decision that you made there. Yeah, so basically there was um, there was a letter that I received that I either I either get a COVID test and prove that I'm negative. Um, I had to now move to a new building, a used car lot, and it was depleted at the time. And there was so much change that was happening at the time in those circumstances that it just wasn't a future for Jake Lowen anymore. And, and you were, you were told you either stop seeing your, your brother-in-law who was a truck driver that's correct. and stuff like that. That's correct. Yeah. I was told at the time that, you know, a family that was entering in and out of the country that I would, you know, I should uh, stay away or, from them. And uh, I said, that's not going to happen. And I'm not going to get a COVID test because I'm a perfectly healthy human being. And I had no reason to get one, not that I wanted to be stubborn, but 
I just thought that these circumstances for me to, you know, continue employment there was was not something that I was interested in. It, it was kind of like what a lot of nurses and doctors are facing now with the COVID vaccine thing, right? Where you were, you were being asked, just jump through this one hoop. But you know that once you're through that hoop, there's going to be another one. It's going to be another one. It's going to be this lifelong yes. pursuit of, am I good enough now? Did I do enough now? Can I be in your good books now? Right. And yes, it was like, do I choose this good livelihood of sitting at a desk, talking to people like you love to do and selling cars? Or do I say, okay, fine, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. And that, that was basically the ultimatum. And then there was other layoffs happening at this place and it looked really grim. And now uh, looking back, there has been now over, I think over 12 people laid off um, another uh, salesperson, another finance person laid off. And so it's not, um, it was not an area of work that I want to continue in. And I believe that God used me there just so that I could develop better people skills, right. how to handle objections and, and, and just deal with customer retentions. Because I think in a way that it, it kind of prepared me to, to come into ministry. Nice. Yeah. But anyway, I kind of interrupted you there. You were saying that then you, you went back to Remtech and you were there for a few months and then yeah, uh, I was there. I, I was there a, a week short of uh, uh, I was there a week short of a day or yeah, a week short of a year from uh, from uh, you know working there a full year at Remtech. Um, it was it was a great place. Everything was working really well. I I I do miss it to an extent. There's things that I do miss about it, but uh, but I knew that. Ultimately, that you know, there may be something in the future, Ken Ling, for for ministry, and and so we went and worked there, and I, I left there at the end of uh, right in the middle of July of 2021, and uh, basically we got our things together and and moved out west. Nice. So for now, you've rented out your house. You're in Winnipeg. You're doing some training is what I understand. You'll be uh, kind of an under pastor there until you have all your training completed, your schooling done. And then from there you get to decide or they decide for you or what's the, what's your future? Uh, yeah. As of right now. Um, yeah. I, I will be like, I'm studying right now. Um, there's going to be more courses coming uh, in seminary in January. Um, and then basically in three years, we're going to assess what's going to happen. Um, my, my mentorship is five years. So I'm supposed to split it three years in, at one church and then the other two years at another church um, potentially, but, but it all depends what's going to happen in three years. If, if uh, there's a vacant opening, if the uh, CMB, which is the Canadian mission board decides that I go somewhere else um, or if I stay, so that's kind of up in the air. I'm, I'm just focusing on my, you know, three years or five years that I am going to be in the mentorship. And then I guess we'll, we'll decide, uh, uh, or I guess we'll see what's going to happen. But as of right now, we're, we're for sure in Winnipeg for three years. And while you're there, you're getting, um, some type of salary or they're covering the cost of your living, things like that. Yeah, so right now, um, the our our uh, umbrella uh, church in terms of the CMB Mission Board has a really good system. Uh, they pay for our housing, and then we get a we get a little bit of a salary still, you know, for groceries and stuff. But uh, one of the biggest blessings is is that you know our housing is paid for. Um, you know, the house that we live in, we live in the church parsonage, which is a a fantastic house. Um, we really appreciated uh, that they decided uh, us to move in here because the pastor of our congregation bought his own house. He was living in this parsonage for 12 years. He's been a pastor here for 12 years and he's been living in this house and just his kind heartedness is, you know, they moved out, they bought their own place because he's settling in to retire in the future. So he wanted his own place. Hmm. 
and that they moved into a smaller house and we were able to move into this house and nice it's it's an amazing uh, amazing house and we're very thankful for it i guess uh one thing i'd like to touch on yet before we close this off is um i didn't ever really necessarily see you moving into ministry at least not for the purpose of a career change right mm -hmm. like it wasn't like i'm going to go into ministry so i don't need to work or i'm going to do this so that i can make more money or anything like that what is it that drives you what is your your goals and your ambitions with ministry yeah that's a really good question um and i've thought of this several times and somebody had asked me this question uh prior to us going into ministry you know like are you going into ministry for money and and I said, well, I said, if we want to be comfortable, I would stay in Sparta Absolutely. where we were, you know, just finished the, uh, the basement with, with the help of a, of a really good friend. And uh, I had a good job, able to make ends meet. I was very thankful for that. And, and so that wasn't the issue. Um, you know, ministry was not about going in it for the money or having an ease of life. Right. Um, I personally felt that, that this is either a calling or it's not. To me, it's not an occupation that I hold. It's not something that I just, you know, come to every day as a normal job. Mm -hmm. I, I see this as a calling personally. Uh, which kind of already started several years ago in terms yeah. of, in terms of, uh, you know, this, this thought process already. And I see it as an, indiv as a, as an individual who, who wants other people to come to Christ and to see the glorious gospel in terms of being free from sin, having salvation and knowing that you are saved and that you have eternity waiting and that's mm -hmm. kind of what the driving force is behind this and because i know where i came from i know what kind of lifestyle i lived there's so many hurting people out there that that haven't been given compassion or grace um you know or or dignity in that sense and i think that i think that there there needs to be more people that have a calling and a passion just like you that want to see people save that want to see people embrace the gospel and that's what this is about amen and then on above and beyond that i think you know there's people that need to hear the gospel and be saved like you and i like you back when you were smoking pot and you needed to know the truth of the gospel but then like just like five years later when you saw that not only did jesus die for my sins but he died for everything like he, his death and his burial and resurrection is almost on every page of the scriptures it's it's in interlaced in through everything right so now you have the opportunity not only to get people saved but for those who are kind of who are saved but haven't really seen the fullness of the gospel to point them constantly again and again and again to the finished work of jesus it's about christ it's about his work right that's right yeah absolutely um i think that there's a lot of people that that have made a decision one time in their life to embrace the gospel and that are uh, potentially that are saved possibly i don't know but how somehow still are ridden with guilt and shame and they, they don't can't see get over clearly. that clearly yeah yeah they can't get over that and that's where uh you know and i think everybody is in that position at one point but but you know uh, christ brings you through that and and then you see yourself in in light of the gospel that look apart from christ this is who i was but i'm no longer that individual and so there's a lot of counseling and a lot of teaching and preaching on that matter just so that christians can live to their full of potential and not amen. have all this guilt and shame amen yeah that's awesome i appreciate he hearing it from that in that perspective and even the fact that you threw in light of the gospel in there that's kind of nice <laughs> yeah yeah it's kind of your podcast name but right no, that's that's good i've really enjoyed myself immensely um hopefully this this gives people a glimpse of of uh you know what i am and and many people may not understand me and in that sense and i and i understand and i get it you know um but uh i think that um 
there's much more uh, underneath the surface uh, in regards to an individual than always Absolutely. what's on the surface of that person. Yeah, that, that's the kind of the goal of me talking to you. Obviously, yeah. I like to just catch up and, and tell your story, yeah. but to, to let people yeah. know too that, hey, there's someone over here who is fully committed to a calling and a, a gift that yeah. you're honing in and trying to perfect. And, you know, people can pray for that and think of you in that regard, hopefully send you in messages of encouragement and stuff. Yeah, we've been, we've been very, very blessed um, by people back home that have been so kind to us, uh, you know, like you guys and your family. And there's been many other people from our local body. Um, the people here have just embraced us. Um, we have a lot of Russian Germans here, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, my kids are learning high German. It's a bit of a culture and difference though from here, eh? It is, it's a big culture difference. Um, you know, there's a lot of high German here. And, and then we have some Russian Germans that, that speak Plattdeutsch. Okay. Oh, really? And so, yeah. And so we speak Plattdeutsch to them and, uh, and it's, it's amazing. And so we've, we've really enjoyed it. And, and like you said, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm committed to this and I, I'm holding on to Christ because he's the only one that made this possible. And if you're looking at it from the outside in terms of, you know, you know, occupational position in terms of having a good life, uh, you know, financially and having a good job and having everything, you know, then it doesn't make sense to those type of people. Right. You know, it will not make sense. That's right. But, and I, I believe Christ has led us to this and, and we just have to trust that he's going to get us through and, and uh, meet all our needs. Right on. Well, yeah. I'm going to close it out there. Any last words of encouragement or, or uh, things you'd like yeah, to I just, people? I just like to say thank you personally, Dan, for having me. It's been a real pleasure and honor to be your friend and to be a guest on your show. Awesome. Uh, secondly, if anybody's struggling with uh, marijuana addiction, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm sure Dan can give that information and and I just like to say that, uh, you know, Christ can free you from, from your addiction. He can truly free you, whatever it is, you know, addicted to pornography or whatever it may be. Um, he can free you and take that guilt and shame away and uh, take that heart of flesh out and put a new heart of stone in. Amen. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's amazing what he can do. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jake. Okay. Yep. God bless you. See you. You too.